Welcome back, everybody. This is the third of four lectures for muscle tissue histology from a Da Vinci Academy. And in this lecture, we're going to be covering the histology of cardiac muscle tissue. This video is sponsored by Doc to Doc, the personal lending platform designed for doctors by doctors. Do you have some big expenses in the near future? Maybe you're moving, applying to residency or fellowship, fixing up your car or home, or starting a new practice. Doc to Doc believes that traditional lenders overestimate the risk of lending money to doctors, residents, and medical students, focusing too much on the challenges of their financial past and giving them insufficient credit for the promise of their financial future. Check out Dr. Doc's personal loan options at drdoclending.com slash da Vinci. So first, just an overview of cardiac muscle. It's composed of an organized network of interconnected cardiomyocytes, cardiac muscle cells, and these cells are connected at regions called intercalated discs, which we show down here in this diagram. So here's a cardiac myocyte, here's a cardiomyocyte, and they, these cells actually branch out, and these would be branching from another cell, and then they are joining here at these intercalated discs as well. These intercalated discs, as we'll talk about a little bit later, contain high concentrations of membrane junctions, including gap junctions, which help transmit electrical signals or action potentials between cardiomyocytes to carry out cardiac contraction. Cardiomyocytes contain sarcomeres, just like skeletal muscle cells do, and they're connected in series and generating that striated appearance that you also will see in cardiac muscle. However, there's less connective tissue in cardiac muscle than there is in skeletal muscle, and it's not as organized into the bundles, like the fascicles, the myofibers, the myofibrils. It's not that level of organization. It's more this branching network of different cardiac muscle cells. Cardiac contraction is not initiated by neural input. It's actually initiated by specialized myocytes called pacemaker myocytes, and then it's spread via gap junction. So there's no nerve, nervous system input involved in at least initiating and carrying out contraction. However, the nervous system can modulate the heart rate and heart contractility, as we'll talk about a little bit later. Cardiac muscle has a dense vascular supply to provide for the high metabolic demands of cardiac muscle. Your heart has to be pumping every second of your entire life, and so you need to be, it needs constant new supply of oxygen and nutrients, and so you need that dense vascular supply. The last thing here we'll point out is that cardiomyocytes are static cells, meaning they do not undergo cell division. They don't re-enter the cell cycle. So that's why a heart attack can be so devastating is because when you cut off perfusion and you have necrosis of cardiomyocytes, they don't come back. Some histological features. So again, they have a striated appearance, and you can see that down here. This is a longitudinal section, so you can see these bands like this. They're not always as prominent, though, as is seen in skeletal muscle. Cardiac mu muscle cells have one centrally located ovoid-shaped nucleus per cell, usually. Sometimes, occasionally, they'll have binucleate cells where you'll have two nuclei, but usually it's just one per cell. They're and again, unlike skeletal muscle, they're located in the center, not in the periphery like skeletal muscle, and they're, and they're round-shaped. Eosinophilic cytoplasm, a lot of mitochondria, the sarcomeres, a lot of different proteins involved in the sarcomere structure, so it's going to give you that bright pinkish-reddish appearance. The intercalated discs, they appear as dark red bands because they have those high concentration of protein. You can also see in cardiac muscle sometimes lip lipofusion granules. These are seen with aging. They're granules that are basically accumulated, broken down uh, lipids and fatty acids. You can see them here. They're kind of goldish, yellowish shaped like this. You can see them in a number of different organs like the heart, the kidney, and they're just, they don't have any significant real function to them. They're just something histologically you can see pop up. Some cellular features. So they contain T tubules, just like skeletal muscle, that interact with the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but they only form a dyad. So you have the sarcolemma like this, you have the T tubule coming down like this, and it only interacts with one terminal cisterna of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So you form a dyad instead of a triad. Cardiac muscle cells also contain more numerous mitochondria compared to skeletal muscle but they have a less complex sarcoplasmic reticulum network. They also have significant glycogen stores in the cytoplasm that are there to provide for the high metabolic demand of cardiomyocytes. So intercalated discs, like we mentioned before, they're connection points between cardiac cells containing a high concentration of the following membrane junctions. So you have macula adherens, also known as desmosomes. These are a mechanical junction they're located in the transverse region of the intercalated disc. We'll talk about what that means in a second. And, does, and they do not contain actin filaments. 
Fascia adherens, these are also mechanical junctions, also located in the transverse region. They contain alpha actinin. Remember, we talked about this back in the skeletal muscle lecture in regards to the sarcomere. These help anchor actin filaments from sarcomeres. Then lastly here, you have gap junctions, which are an ionic communication, which create an electrical synapse between myocytes. So intercalated discs, they have a jagged shape, meaning they have a lateral and a transverse portion. So if we draw this out here, so this would be cardio myocyte number one. And then we'll draw another membrane here like this. And this would be cardiomyocyte number two. Now, this is if you, again, this is this diagram we showed earlier. These are the intercalated discs between. So here's one cardiac cell. Here's another one. And then this one again branches out. And then at these branch points, you have intercalated discs as well. And these would go on to other cardiomyocytes. So if you were to zoom in even more so on these, what you would notice is that this would, these portion, this more flat portion, this would be the lateral portion here, and these would contain mainly gap junctions. So these would be gap junctions. And then on the transverse portions, which would be here and here, and then an angle here and here, these lines would correspond to the macula adherence and the fascia adherence. So the lateral portions are for forming those electrical synapse via the gap junctions, and then these transverse portions are more for creating a mechanical junction and holding the cells end to end. Cardiac contraction, like we've said before, does not require neural input. Cardiac contraction is initiated by pacemaker myocytes, which are essentially specialized cells that generate the action potential that initiates contraction. So if you look over here, here's the heart right here. This would be the right atrium and the sequence of cardiac contraction. So it's initiated in the sinoatrial node, which would be the SA node, which is found here in the region of the right atrium. Then these will travel through both atria, the right and the left atrium, and then it'll converge on this section right here. So it'll come back around like this. It'll converge on the AV node, also known as the atrioventricular node. So the electrical signals going through these fibers in the atria are traveling at an at a elevated rate. And so you want to essentially slow those down to kind of time up contraction of the ventricles. And so you want to make sure that the atria and ventricles are contracting in sequence to ensure efficient blood flow, not only through the heart, but then also out of the heart as well. And so they meet here at the, at the AV node, and then they travel through the bundle of Hiss and then from the bundle of Hiss, they go through these Purkinje fibers, which you can see here and here and here. And they, these Purkinje fibers then travel up through the muscle tissue. And these Purkinje fibers are specialized types of myocytes, and they carry the action potential from the pacemaker cells to the myocardial myocytes, also known as the cardiac muscles, muscle itself, via gap junctions at intercalated discs. And then like we've said before, heart rate and then cardiac contractility, is which is essentially the strength of contraction so if you increase contractility, you're going to increase the strength of the pumping action of the heart, be able to pump more blood. Those are mo these both are modulated by autonomic innervation at the SA node. So the autonomic nervous system, let's say you're startled or you want to run away from something, you want to increase your heart rate, the autonomic nervous system will, in response to that, the flight or fight response will cause an increase in your heart rate by stimulating the SA node. And then lastly here, for cardiac muscle hypertrophy, cardiac muscle cells, like we said, they're static cells. They do not have those satellite stem cells that the skeletal muscle do to regenerate them. And also cardiac muscle cells do not undergo hyperplasia. So if a cardiac muscle cell becomes ne necrose, undergoes necrosis, it's not coming back. However, cardiac muscle cells can undergo hypertrophy in response to increased peripheral vascular resistance or exercise. So examples of peripheral vascular resistance would be chronic hypertension, aortic stenosis, and then hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, which is essentially where the initial part of the aorta is narrowed. And so if we draw kind of a simple diagram down here, this is the RV, this would be the LV, we'll draw the aorta coming out, and this would be the aortic valve, so this would be the aorta. So if someone has, let's say, aortic stenosis, 
the resistance here for the flow to come out of the left ventricle and into the aorta and then to the rest of the body is significantly increased because it's, you have a much narrower outlet. So you need to generate more pressure to generate the same amount of blood flow through this. So what happens is to overcome this, the myocytes within the left ventricle over time, they undergo hypertrophy to help generate a, a more consistent elevated force to help compensate for this increased resistance. Same thing would happen is if you had increased peripheral vascular resistance, if you had increased due to hypertension, you know, it's the same kind of thing. The heart still has to overcome that significant resistance. Because remember, pressure flows from high pressure to low pressure. It's all about the gradient. So the higher the pressure is here, the, more, the less of a gradient there is. And so you need to generate more pressure here to overcome that. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please like the video and subscribe to our channel to check out more histology videos and other medical education videos.